<laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's it's great to have you here. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's a, it's a great honor to have you at our uh, event today and a privilege uh, for me to, to meet you. I was a 10-year a employee of BIO, so, um, you know, it's a very close to my heart and uh, I'm, I'm excited uh, when I was very excited to see that, that you were hired. So Michelle uh, came on as the CEO of BIO on June 1st of this year. Uh, she's a medical doctor and molecular, Im Im molecular immunologist by training. Uh, and she's only the third chief executive officer of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization uh, in 23 years. So um, really stable leadership. And, and I know some of the staff that I still know there are very happy to have you aboard. Um, one of the, what she's going to talk about today, but one of the common threads in, in Michelle's career uh, has been focusing on broadening access to to more patients uh, from diverse backgrounds and get access to that cutting edge innovation. Uh, one of the quotes from her biography or biography is uh, that says the distribution of scientific progress is the social justice issue of our age. So, um, you know, I think that's an amazing quote. Uh, she was most recently at Johnson and Johnson where she served as global head of evidence generation and medical device companies, and then vice president for global external innovation and global leader for regulatory sciences. Um, she's had uh, other uh, jobs in, in government, including uh, the Obama-Biden transition team, as well as uh, she was then named the associate science director of the FDA's uh, CDRH, so which a lot of people here will, will be very familiar with uh, since a lot of this is medtech focused. Um, uh, Dr. McMurray Heath uh, received her MD PhD from D Duke Medical, Duke's Medical Sciences Training Program, uh, becoming the first African American to graduate from the program. So uh, really appreciate you coming on and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to join you guys today. Um, and it sounds like you're having a really robust and fascinating dialogue. So thank you for that introduction, um, Jason, and thank you to Southeast Life Sciences. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about access and equity. You know, we're living through some extraordinary times. I don't need to tell anyone on this um, conversation about that, but times in which every person on the planet depends on science to restore our way of life and keep our loved ones safe. You know, it's a time when the scientists and researchers of the biotechnology industry are setting the world on fire. We're transforming modern medicine in real time while the whole world watches. The all time record for speed on vaccine development is four years. That was for the mumps vaccine back in the 1960s. We're on pace to shatter that record by next spring. And not because of political pressure, although there is quite a bit of that, but because of revolutionary biotechnology platforms enabled by the Human Genome Project and subsequent research. Today, there are more than 800 COVID medicines, vaccines, and therapeutics in development. That all, all of these development projects have been started since January of this year. That includes over 180 vaccine candidates against the virus. So we hear a lot about the roughly 10 that are entering um, phase two or phase three clinical trials, but there are 180 shots on goal for developing a vaccine and hundreds of antivirals, antibodies, and other treatments um, in the pipeline as well. More than half of these drugs are already in clinical testing and more than half are being developed by US companies. So that's right. We make more COVID medicines in the US than the rest of the world combined. And it's the small biotechs that are really driving this. 70% of these candidates are coming from small biotech companies. So if we stand by our scientists, we could have multiple COVID vaccines by next year. So we've lived through the industrial revolution and the digital revolution, but now we're entering the bio revolution. And government and industry have an opportunity, and I would say an obligation, to work together in the face of our threats to our economy, our families, and our way of life. This summer, I was given the honor of becoming just the third person, as, as you heard, and the first woman to lead bio in our organization's nearly 30 years of existence. My first day on the job was June 1st, one week 
after George Floyd was killed. The pandemic was raging at its peak and so was our national anger about inequality and injustice. I see a central part of my job as helping the outside world see the passion, the commitment, the brilliance and the dedication to changing the world and improving health that is typical of the people who I know work in biotech. I think it's a puzzlement to many people in our industry how we got to a situation where any company that makes biopharmaceuticals is disparaged or misunderstood. I hope that that's starting to change in the midst of COVID. When we start producing cures and therapies, I hope the public will give us a second look. We've had to make sure that these therapeutics are affordable, which is why we believe there should be a law, no co-pays for COVID drugs, and that we're holding a summit dedicated to pushing that idea over the next week. One thing that has changed is that the average person now knows what it feels like to wait for a medicine that they need to be approved. That's a wait that's not fair. And for a medicine that's not yet available and still needs to go through clinical trials and be tested, people are used to waiting to get getting into the doctor's office, but it's different when the doctor can't help you once you're inside because we don't yet have the safe, sound, and verified science to help. This gives us an opportunity to really restart that dialogue with the American public about why and how we do what we do. As you heard, I see science as the social justice issue of our age. And I mean that because every intractable issue we face today, you know, in um, climate change and global warming, um, access to clean water and food, um, better nutrition and hunger, as well as health, those are all going to be bridged by, by scientific solutions. And I say that as the daughter of public health leaders. I got to see firsthand growing up how poor and vulnerable communities were really locked into those inequalities because of their poor access to scientific breakthroughs and the poor application of science to their needs. Democrats and Republicans and innovators and insurers can argue until we're blue in the face about how much a drug that's on the shelf should cost. But if we're not talking about the engine that's putting new medicines on that shelf, then we're just perpetuating the injustice. So COVID has laid bare the clear links between poverty and environmental injustice, as well as systemic racism in our healthcare system. Today, Black Americans are dying from COVID at three times the rate of their white counterparts. But COVID is just the latest in a long line of diseases that show stark disparities in health outcomes. So last month, with the enthusiastic support from the bio board, the bio staff and the biotech community, we launched Bioequality. And it has three simple pillars. First is making a huge and demonstrable stand for health equality and for ending health disparities. And that includes equitable access to therapies and equitable representation of women and minorities in clinical trials. We need our trials to reflect the people that they're going to eventually serve. Industry controls the incentives community research organizations receive for, um, for trial enrollment so we can control the critical lever for change. We can make sure that CROs are really pushing to make sure they have minorities enrolled in trials. And we can make it an industry priority and a national priority to study people in clinical trials in closer proportion to their prevalence in the patient communities our medicines seek to serve. Black people are under indexed in clinical trials by 20%. So Bio is calling on our own member companies to take a leadership role in addressing racial disparities in clinical trials. We're working with groups like the Urban League and the National Black Churches on trust building initiatives in communities of color. And so we hope that this work can make a direct and immediate impact because it's so badly needed. Our second pillar is around hiring and promotion. We wanna make sure that minority candidates are seen and heard and given the opportunity to progress within our biotech companies. I was one of the many that benefited from one of the great minority training programs that our industry runs. I had a United Negro College Fund Merck Fellowship as a graduate student. It was tremendous. And many of our companies have been doing this kind of work for decades. 
So Biogen, for example, has trained more than 250 African-American scientists in the Boston area over the last 10 years. And that's just one example out of many. But once these individuals go through the programs, they're not necessarily tracked or followed, and they're sometimes lost to follow up, that term we know so well in health research. So we're hoping to create a LinkedIn type avenue for all of the alumni of these corporate training programs to be visible to BIO's 1000 member companies to help form a pool of amazing talent that can be drawn upon. And the third pillar is to support the growth of minority and women owned businesses. As we climb out of the hole that COVID has dug for us, we wanna make sure that our supply chains are diverse. So we're gonna start by looking at our own bio business solution programs that help small companies get purchasing deals so that they can purchase like a large company would to make sure that in that program, we have lots of minority owned businesses and women owned businesses among our own suppliers. And we're gonna advocate for more diversity and in innovation research grants dispersed by the National Institutes of Health. Many of you are familiar with the small, uh, small business innovation grants, the SBIR grants, and the representation of African-Americans in that, in that population is estimated to be as low as 0.5%. So there is room for improvement. So when it comes to help people access the latest science, we have to get the incentives right as well. Laws like the Orphan Drug Act showed Congress can rebalance the incentives for investors to go after rare diseases, transforming the FDA pipeline in the process. We can do it again for diseases affecting vulnerable populations or for new antibiotics that haven't built up resistance or for non-opioid alternatives to pain. Unfortunately, we're playing a lot of defense lately. We've seen political pressure on the FDA that's undermining public trust in the safety and efficacy of vaccines in the world at the worst possible time. A crisis of this magnitude requires us to double down on scientific integrity, not to abandon it. We must not let speed overcome scientific rationale and common sense. We've got one shot to do this right. And if we allow an unproven vaccine to be made widely available before it's ready for use, we'll not only lose the confidence of our citizens, but we'll delay future scientific progress. So we're trying to walk a tightrope and stand up for the independence and integrity of the FDA. So a vaccine against COVID will only work if people trust it and take it. So we have to double down on the science and the data and the support for FDA. So I wanna wrap up and leave some time for questions, but let me just say, it's, I've been at Bio for three months and I wanna use meetings like this to hear your ideas. So please don't hold back. It's a pleasure to get to meet you if only virtually. And I wanna close by reminding everyone that November 3rd is election day and science is on the ballot this year. We are the industry that cures and prevents disease and that the world is depending on to end the COVID pandemic. The biotech workforce is 1.7 million people strong. So let's make our collective voice heard. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm going to tag team uh, with questions with Michelle Shields, uh, one of the, actually the SEMDA the Southeast uh, Life Sciences Chair, uh, co-chair. So I, I do want to ask a quick follow-up question on your uh, diversity initiative. I was looking through the website today, and, and for those um, that, that want to check it out, it's the Right Mix Matters uh, part of the uh, bio.org. Um, so go check it out. One of the really interesting things that, that I saw today um, was, what it was, oh, sorry, <laughs> bio board list which is, uh, I think, fantastic. Uh, can you go into a little bit about that? Because I know this is a question that um, has come up, even as I've, and Michelle and I, and others on the board have looked to, to create some diversity in our own board. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That was an initiative started about three years ago um, by a workforce development and diversity initiative, which was a board initiative, a bio board initiative, um, begun around with CEOs that were just really, really interested in how bio could get more inv involved in the diversity space. And it was really around creating a list, uh, a vetted list of potential female candidates for um, boards and biotech companies. 
Um, and it has been successful in moving the needle, but we want to blow it up. We want to make it um, bigger and more powerful. So more of that to come. And um, that's what we're hoping to really expand um, with this LinkedIn-like atmosphere or community that will let people have better line of sight and visibility to the great talent we have in our field. Fantastic. Michelle, do you want to hop in or do you want me to keep going? Sure, I'll hop in for just one. I have to tell you, we are so thrilled to have you and thank you for sharing that powerful message, your voice, your presence, and what you're bringing to the table for our industry. We're, we're just, we, we are so excited and so grateful that you spent some time with us today. Um, one of the questions that we often have from young women and other young mentors um, are, and other young entrepreneurs is who, who were their mentors? And, and who helped them along the way. And so would you be willing to share with us how that worked for you? And was there someone special that mentored you and what activities did they help with and what guidance was valuable to you? Sure, well, I was fortunate to have many. Um, and as I look back through the years, especially since I, I had the privilege of working in many different fields. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to see and experience mentors of different stripes. Um, but one of the ones that has really bridged um, those transitions and has really supported me over the last 15 years, I would say, if not even a little bit longer than that, is Peggy Hamburg, um, former FDA commissioner. And she was part of the reason why I went to the FDA um, as she was coming on for commissioner. And she's um, such an outstanding advocate. She's very quiet in her leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and many people don't know that her father was a, um, a path-breaking um, social scientist and her mother was one of the first African-American female um, psychiatrists um, to um, be in academia. So she has this very, very interesting background, um, but she's very strong and very supportive of many women coming up behind her. And I think that's a pattern that is so wonderful to see someone who always remembers to reach back and bring other women along with them. Thank you. We, we all agree that's our goal. And, and the, other, the other topic that tends to come about at these conferences are, is how should men be involved in advancing the careers of both women and minorities? And what should, you know, was there someone special that helped you along the way in that regard? And how do we engage them to also provide those opportunities you discussed today? So many. Um, I still remember, <laughs> actually, one of the funniest stories is when I was an undergraduate, I thought I was going to go into um, psychology. And my father said, who was a psychologist said, well, you might also want to think about medicine. And so I spent the first year taking some lab science and I was like, oh, this is kind of boring. One of my TAs said, well, when you go home for the summer, you should work in a lab because it's totally different than what you do in the classroom. Um, and I went to UC Berkeley, which was my local college <laughs> where I grew up. And I got the list of all the biology professors in the department. And I remember there were 29 of them. And I called each and every one of them thinking, oh, I'm a Harvard undergraduate home for the summer. Of course, they'll have a job waiting for me. Mm -hmm. When the 28th one had said no, I was about to give up. And the 29th one called me back. And it was a woman named Sydney Kustu who um, took me under her wing, let me work in her lab, really see what it was like to do novel research where you didn't know the answer before you got started and then helped me when I went back to Harvard find um, a professor named um, Rick who was just amazing and he really helped me throughout all the entire remaining three years of my undergraduate career um, and I worked in his lab for three years solid and it really got gave me the opportunity to publish gave me the opportunity to see what lab research was really about. So Rich Losex Lab was an amazing place to be trained. And um, I was just very, very fortunate to get to work with him. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to throw it back to Jason to ask a few more questions, unless there's other questions from the group or Jane or anyone. Jane, I thought there might be a hand there. <laughs> Jane, go ahead. It's a pleasure to meet you. And congratulations on your success. Um, you know, when, when we look out across just the whole healthcare diaspora, there is just a dearth of African-Americans, certainly African-American females. 
Um, and then you, you take that sliver and slice that as thinly as possible. And that's what you see really in leadership. And I wrote an article recently regarding minority recruitment into trials. And one of the barriers that I identified was the lack of leadership within clinical research, within hospitals, people who are actually able to uh, make decisions, um, drive the programs, um, effect change. And uh, you know, I thought it was interesting that you talked about the many mentors that you have, because I would say most black women, especially in science, uh, who are very accomplished, if you take the M off of many, that would be what most of us have. There, there aren't any throughout our entire career. You do not have a single mentor and you move forward. And so I, I was interested in that part of your mission for, for uh, your new launching is how do you promote black women who are accomplished, who may not uh, have access to mentorship uh, within this sliver of a sliver of people who are even really qualified to lead these programs that generally are still dominated by very powerful uh, white men with their agendas and maybe are not receptive to the perspectives um, that others can bring. And how do we begin to bridge that gap and not remove people, but just make room for others to join such that programs can move in different directions and that we really can address health disparities from all different perspectives? Yeah, it's a very, very important question. You know, it's interesting. So I spent almost five years in J&J. And in J&J, there's a big conversational debate internally about what's more important, a mentor or a champion. And the difference is a mentor may meet with you from time to time and tell you about what their life is like. A champion is one that when the doors are closed and the hiring decisions are being debated, will put your name forward for a position and will um, uh, defend and, uh, and argue um, for your accomplishments and your ability. And I think too often we've looked just for mentors um, and we often think that our mentor has to look like us and that our mentor can answer all sorts of questions about absolutely every aspect of our life. My, my career, when I look back at my mentors, it's been much more of a patchwork. You know, there might be uh, one person over here who can help me with this with a scientific technique where I'm stuck. I'm thinking about the Merck scientist I was matched with in my UNCF Merck fellowship program who I, I had absolutely no interest in his personal life. He couldn't guide me about any work-life balance issues. He wasn't going to tell me about what it was like to be an African-American woman in science, but he taught me how to do sucrose gradients in a way that no one in my graduate program could have done and helped me get a science paper published. So, you know, I think sometimes we have to kind of pick and choose what people are in our lives for and how so many pe different people can have something to contribute to, to us and getting us through, as opposed to looking and hoping we'll find someone who, who looks like us, who's walked a very similar path to us, who can answer all of our questions um, in, in one container. Um, I think that's much more difficult to find. And I think we often get disappointed with, uh, with our mentors, not realizing that they're, um, they're struggling with their own um, career challenges and work-life challenges. Um, and we're, we're asking almost too much. I think we should ask a little from a lot of people um, and really get a variety of views because really when you're breaking a path and forging a new path, you're not going to find a mentor who's likely walked your entire path because it's, it's novel. Um, and so you shouldn't be concerned if you don't, if you don't have that one mentor that answers all the questions. I, I think one of the things that, that uh, I, I am interested in, and I've been interested in minority recruitment into clinical trials for a while, is that without real leadership, it's difficult to move um, the mission forward. Um, and without the recruitment of African-American principal investigators who generally are, do not have real connections with academic uh, centers or large medical centers, it's also uh, another barrier that has to be addressed in the recruitment of, of uh, patients into these trials. And so that's why um, I bring that up. It's a multi-step, multifaceted process as, as it always is when you, when you deal with things that are systemic 
There are many mm -hmm. layers that are built into it that have to be addressed almost simultaneously. But that's, that's incredibly important. I don't know if you face this in your career, but I feel like every time I have gotten away from the most immediate way to give back and interact with patient communities, um, I face that tension as to whether or not I am, um, I don't want to air dirty laundry, but betraying the race. You know, it, you feel like when you get farther and farther away as you move from primary care to subspecialty care, as you move from subspecialty care to academic, academic research, when you move to from being doing clinical research to being at the bench, when you move from um, seeing patients to being in a company, each one of those steps can feel like you're getting away from the traditional path of minority clinicians and scientists being at the front lines ready to give back to our communities. But in reality, we need minority leaders in each one of those buckets. Because yep. if we don't have them in each one of those buckets, we will not see progress. So I think we internally have to find a way to change that conversation around career choice and career path to give people more support and, um, and recognition for paths that aren't necessarily the family physician who's working in, in the inner city practice and seeing you know, 50 patients a day, which is of course an amazingly heroic thing to do, but there's lots of other paths to heroism and all are needed. Thank you. I have a quick follow-up, kind of, kind of similar. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we mentioned earlier, right before you came on, that we're um, launching a minorities in, in uh, life sciences group here. And I know Georgia Bio and Maria Thacker is doing a lot at, um, a lot there. What, what are, so this is kind of a two-part question. One, how do we work together? Um, you know, being a regional association, we try really hard not to step on the toes of, of the state associations in the Southeast. Um, we certainly don't want to step on your toes and get, get in each other's way and duplicate efforts. How do we work together? And then taking it a step further into that is, what can individuals do, um, you know, to really make a difference? Because you know, I, I'm a white guy, right? I mean, I, and I know that I can do a lot of things within my small sphere, but what can we do um, as organizations, as people uh, to really make a difference? Now, hold your head high. You are a community advocate and organizer who has experience in how you make things happen and you galvanize people um, to impact policy and change. So that is a set of criteria and um, accomplishments that are sorely needed in this battle. So there's absolutely no reason um, to apologize or be shy about it. We need that contribution. I'm not worried about stepping on toes and I'm not worried about duplication of effort. I think if our biggest problem is that we have too much duplication of effort when it comes to fighting for equality and reducing health disparities, that would be a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> So I think there's room and need for all of us to do everything we can. You know, when we started talking, I'll give you an example. When we started at Bio talking about should we start our own fellowship program? Should we try to, um, you know, raise money to create a new nationwide program uh, to support scientists? I was like, okay, what do we uniquely do well as an organization? what resources and perspectives do we uniquely have access to and where can we most make a difference? And the biggest thing we do is we link companies across the country. And so since we have companies that are pouring in lots of resources into these programs, we thought the best thing we can do is raise the visibility of those programs, figure out what the best practices are and disseminate those best practices, and then link the people who are coming through those programs so that they can be hired and visible by each and every company um, that comes in contact with bio. So that was our way. We weren't worried about duplicating effort. We were worried about what do we uniquely have to offer that can be a piece of the puzzle. And I think that's the more important question. So whatever you're gonna do, do it well. Don't worry if someone else is already doing it because that's important too. Um, and just uh, be courageous in it, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, that's a fantastic answer. I really appreciate that. Sure. Michelle? Jason, to you, to you and Jane to close, so. So I, I do have, so one more quick question. Um, uh, bef before we let you go, um, as you've talked through this and, and your initiative and, you know, 
the multiple initiatives around the country, both at the corporate level and, and you know, for us, regional, state level. What, what's the, what's success? What does success look to you in diversity? And actually, I will have one follow-up question about bio, but in diversity, um, when do we say we did it? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the short answer is when um, our life expectancies and our health issues uh, do not vary based on our race or ethnicity. Um, that's unfortunately not a leading indicator, though, of <laughs> success. That's, that's one of the late stage indicators of getting it right. Um, I think one of the leading indicators will be when we have very diverse boards around our companies, when we have um, diverse entrepreneurs, when we see the people rolling up their sleeves and working in biotechnology and medical technology um, that are very, very diverse and don't even think about diversity as being part of what they um, are pushing for and do that success. Uh, I think about, you could probably hear some rustling in the background. I think about my eight-year-old daughter um, <laughs> and, and, her, um, and her classmates. And for example, they see gender in a way that's completely different than I saw it growing up as when I was eight years old. It's just, they go about it in a lot more fluid, combined, joyous way um, than you know we did when we were kids. Um, and there's a lot less pressure on them about it. And it's something that they just presume as a right. Um, and that is wonderful and joyous to see. I think when we get to the point, and I know there's been lots of debate about whether colorblind societies are really our goal, but I think when we get to a point where our children um, see the variety and the wonderful spectrum of colors that we have with that same sense of fluidity and, and joy, then we'll be in really good stead. But that's a, a little ways away. Great, thank you. Oh, uh, I, and, saw, I saw one other hand. Oh, up. Cornelius. That just spurred, uh, um, I have a really quick question. And so my name is Cornelius. I lead a, a firm in the Atlanta area that connects, really working in the Silicon Valley area, helping health tech companies understand how to engage in underserved and marginalized communities. Um, because one of the things we see that we have a lot of technologists that really don't understand communities of color and how to you know, put those innovations within those communities without taking advantage of them. So, um, but my bigger question is, how do you keep the momentum moving forward? We're now in this COVID-19 environment. We are talking about Black Lives Matter. This will all subside in some time because it does. That's just the way sometimes news cycles work. But health disparities will still exist. People will move on and do their day-to-day -day activities once we have a vaccine and things are back to normal. My biggest concern is after all this passes away and we go back to normal, we still have issues as it relates to health disparities, the social determinants of health that, and all these things that are impacted, that, that, that are just now being elevated in this moment. From where you sit, how do you keep this conversation moving forward in a thoughtful, in a thoughtful way? Yeah. So I think we actually get kind of psychological fatigue. You know, um, it's not that we just get distracted you're probably like me and like many of us, we, we know the backlash is coming. The question is just when. <laughs> and so those of us who have kind of been through these battles once or twice before, you kind of gird your loins because you know they'll, they'll be the backslide after the, uh, after the progress. But I think the answer is really gonna have to come from the technologists. I had a public health professor who used to say, if you have a road that goes along a cliffside and every month there's a car that goes off the side of the cliff and ends up crashing at the bottom of the hill. You know, people in traditional medicine build a hospital at the bottom of the hill. We in public health build a guardrail around the road so that the cars don't veer off the mountain <laughs> to begin with. And I think that is a very, um, a very important illustration for what we're trying to do. I think technology and data, particularly big data and the ability now to deliver it to the bedside and to the point of care can be that sunshine disinfectant 
that gives people the information to know or to verify whether or not they're treating a patient equitably or whether or not their biases are getting in the way of delivering the standard of care. And we that have experience in technology and the ability to look at cutting edge research need to figure out what are the ways we can deliver or, or construct those guardrails into the delivery of healthcare and into the generation of new solutions and cures so that when those, when those backslides come, you know, when people tire of the fight, when people get distracted and move on to another issue, we've already built the path, we've already built the guardrails to keep people moving towards equity. So that's what I think is really important to focus on. Sure thing. Thank you. And I, I'm going to, so uh, I crossed paths on both Carl Feldbaum and, and Jim Greenwood's terms at, at bio. And, uh -huh. you know, I think Carl was, uh, you know, obviously started the organization with the merger of the two smaller groups in DC and um, really built that, uh, you know, created the convention and um, made it into something just super, super powerful, particularly from a business development perspective. I think, you know, with Jim, um, <clears throat> You know, I would say that, um, as he, he said, one of his goals make uh, bio world-class advocacy organization. I think Jim certainly accomplished that. So in 15, 20 years, when you retire, what do you want to say? What's your vision? I want to say that we inspired scientists and entrepreneurs to realize the responsibility and the ability they have to impact policy that individual scientists and individual entrepreneurs realize that they should be our leaders in, in the society and fighting for progress um, and looking beyond just their lab bench or their development program. Um, that's what I hope to inspire and that's what I hope we see that we really create a movement where people are galvanized um, to think about science when they're thinking about the important decisions for the country. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming as, as we all do. Um, tremendous talk and um, I'm excited to, to continue to follow you uh, as you, you know, uh, work through bio and, and build, you know, uh, the next step of just a tremendous, tremendous organization. So thank, thank you very you much. So much. And again, like yesterday, some Zoom claps. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for having me. Thank really you. Appreciate it. All right. Take Have care. a good one. Bye-bye.